There is one topic that comes up over and over again with the clients that we work with, really no matter where they come from around the world. It's the topic of innovation. Everybody seems to think that we all need to innovate. But when we really start to ask questions about why and how and what, we find that it's sort of a word that people are still trying to figure out what it means. So I have a couple people with me today. We're going to have a great conversation around innovation and specifically creativity as well. We'll start with Dr. Evans Baya. Uh, Evans has been a friend for many years. Evans, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got here today. So I am um, an innovation consultant. And what does that mean? That means that I'm working with you, the clients, you, the entrepreneurs, you, the scientists, to bring up about ideas to solve problems or actually take advantage of opportunities that you have. Great. And I said PhD. So what's your PhD in? It's in engineering and technology development. Okay, good. Do you have any other graduate degrees? Yes, I do. And all those help me in making sure that I have a global context, both in science, in business, uh, in engineering, to provide the best solutions possible, or at least to point me to the right direction as we work with clients. Yeah, so I, I always have to pull this out of you every time we're together. <laughs> so, okay, you said you do have other postgraduate degrees. In chemistry. So, the, okay, the first one you got out of college was... Yes, in chemistry and uh, uh, electrical engineering, uh, an MBA, yeah. and of course a PhD. And have you done any, any other postgraduate work? Yes, I've done some work in, uh, at Harvard Business School. <laughs> in, um, Just a little uh, bit. Business strategy and intellectual property. Yeah. And so, again, those are tools that I use to help my clients, but it's not just myself, to also recognize what are the needs they have that we can bring uh, together to, uh, so that we can get the best product or best outcome through the innovation program. Yeah, great. So you're an innovation consultant. Have you always been a consultant or have you been in other kinds of roles? No, I have had a lot of other roles. This is, this is I want to call it the second life, if you will, because there's the corporate life, which um, I was part of. Uh, I was in applied materials for, for 10 years and where I started as, as a research chemist all the way to leading a global team that was in charge of innovation. And, uh, you know, we had uh, scientists in 20 plus countries doing high, um, high end you know, research, looking into the future. And of course, in semiconductor, we always used to talk about Moore's law. We still talk about it even today. Yes. And you no, know, but we were looking at innovating around new systems, uh, of course, softwares, robotics, uh, new materials that will enable us to continue to push uh, the Moss Law. So that we, today, we are using technologies that even 10, 15 years ago, we did not even know what materials we would use to wow. make them. That's amazing. And, and I know I've heard yeah. you say, but for the benefit of our viewing audience, how many scientists were a part of this innovation group that you were? Uh, 400. 400. 400 scientists, and um, about 270 of those were PhDs. 270 PhDs. Yes. And around the world, I'm assuming, around not all in one world. city. Yes, around the world. But those mainly in the U.S. that we had uh, were, of course, scattered in different cities within the United States. But most of them coming from Ivy schools, and that's we were trying to get the best of the best in terms of physics, uh, engineering, mathematics, whatever it is, but to help us to create the best solutions for the future because we are creating a future. We don't know exactly what the future looks like, but we have to create one. And we have to hope that what we are creating is what the world will need five, eight, ten years uh, uh, to come. And that was our task. It was a lot of fun. Great. So I'm going to come back to you in a moment. But yeah. first, Courtney Fighter, I appreciate you joining us today. I really wanted you to be a part of this conversation because of some of the talks I've heard you give around creativity. And before we get into that, tell me a little bit about your background. Yeah, um, well, I really am a lifelong artist. So I started drawing and painting and all that when I was really young, but I never really acknowledged my own creativity and saw myself as truly creative till I was maybe in high school. And then I worked with it more in college and began to apply it when I worked in corporate marketing. 
and I worked with some pretty major companies and global brands in pharmaceuticals and high tech. And then I eventually moved over to the agency side of things and helped those same companies from the perspective of being their agency. And gradually I started my own agency and for about a decade owned my own brand and marketing and communications agency where I helped some of these people unfold this creative process. And one of the things that I've learned about you is that you are uh, pretty ambitious. You love doing a lot. You're energized by a lot of things. Yeah. And another thing that you've done quite successfully is run an event planning company. That's also. true. Right. Yeah. So that had to do with me trying to convert the experience of a brand mm -hmm. to an actual experience. Mm -hmm. So I believe a lot in experiential creativity kind of across the board. Great. Terrific. So I've heard you use this phrase before that I'd like to talk about a little bit more. I think it was a creative prohibition. Right. So now, after my agency, I converted most of my work time to working on becoming a consultant focused on helping people use creativity as a leadership skill and as a way to benefit really the bottom line of their business by empowering people in the workplace. So creative prohibition comes up because a lot of us, when we're very young, elementary school young, push creativity down. It might be from our peers or shame or how, whatever our perception is of ourselves, but we smash creativity and prohibit it when we're very young. And then some people pull it back up when they're young adults or they kind of renew their identity with creativity. But a lot of people really keep it smashed down and they struggle when they get into the workplace and then they're asked to innovate. Because in my opinion, creativity is really the engine of innovation. I know in a lot of the work that we do with senior leadership teams, sometimes we'll ask them to draw something on flip chart yeah, paper. they get all so nervous. We want to get them communicating in ways other than just words. Right. And I'm sure that you're going to recognize this. Every single time we do that kind of an activity, we hear, I don't know how to draw. I'm not an artist. Yeah. yeah but I'm really, I don't know how to draw or I'm not right. creative. Right. And you're saying there maybe are some people who aren't creative? No, it's my firm opinion that everyone is creative, but that once we prohibit ourselves, we fail to identify that creativity in ourselves. And it takes people mm -hmm. to pull that out and acknowledge it. So these people have to sort of see the artist in themselves, and then they really have to be empowered by the leaders in their company or organization to let them practice that creativity all the time so they can get comfortable with it and comfortable with expressing it. So give us a couple practical ideas of how you, um, I guess you'd say, how you end prohibition. <laughs> um, the easy one that I like to give people that really helps them work into it gradually is I ask them to write down one thing they really succeeded with and one gap they really saw in each workday. Yeah, and that seems doable. Yeah, and it's it usually most people are like, okay, that's no problem, I can do that. It's much less daunting than what kind of artist are you or draw this thing. And then with that, they start to identify that there's a pattern to what they're doing well and what they might have gaps with. And they may either see the solution to that pattern and how they can overcome a gap, or they may see that they need outside assistance. But in any case, they're looking at their world a little differently, and they're typically identifying more than just patterns in their own issue. You know, maybe it's um, patterns in their team or patterns in the whole organization. So, so do you find that organizations can go down this path of becoming more creative on their own, or do they need somebody like you who's sort of the creativity guru or goddess who guides them down this path? Well, I like. Um, I think it's easier if they have a bit of a process and system and they can understand that there's genuinely bottom line impact and return on investment to applying this quickly. So they could do it on their own, yes, probably across the board. Most won't. Um, and most won't really know what process to follow. So what I typically do is kind of expedite it for them, kind of give them a system. And then I work a lot with individual leaders and helping them really understand their own paradigm and how, because I firmly believe that the leader has to begin it and then it can filter to teams. And then that goes all the way out to the marketplace of the consumers they're trying to reach. You know what I really like that I heard you say is I heard you bring up the bottom line. <laughs> Creativity on the bottom line, who knew? Oh, that you can do both yeah, and that they're connected. Yeah, and that very really closely connected. brings me back to Evans yeah. and innovation because I'm sure that at Applied Materials, they weren't just interested in you having 
art workshops. Yeah, yeah, we want <laughs> They wanted some kind of ROI. Yes. And so you were probably thinking about the value of intellectual property that's being created Absolutely. and how do we translate that into products and yeah. services and things like that. Absolutely. And you and I have had the pleasure of uh, co-authoring a book that's just come out recently called The Innovator's Advantage. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about how we got going down that path together. Uh, first of all, it was a really fun project. And um, I, I hope uh, that... Um, we can do it again, first of all. So, but let's talk about how we got there. Um, as you know, as we deal with all these clients, everybody knows the importance of innovation. Everybody talks about it. It's uh, in some circles out there, you call it the buzzword, but it's a buzzword for a reason because everybody wants it. Mm. And everybody understands the importance of it. But we noted that a lot of people have all these systems in place. There's a lot of literature out there on innovation. There's a lot of all kinds of tools. There are actually conventions and uh, disciplines around specific tools like design thinking or agile or even, you know, you can be a black belt. Yeah, in Six Rice, Sigma. In Six Sigma, yeah. you know, you, we have all these models. And to us, we found that, yes, you can have them, and yet you are still not succeeding as an innovation, uh, in your innovation programs. And we started looking to why. And it's very interesting to me is that even those companies that invest a lot of time on the systems and tools and all this training, they miss the most important element in innovation, and that is right in front of them, that is, has been there since time immemorial, but they actually miss it. So we started looking into what that is. Wow, you are such a dramatist. You just bring us right up to the brink. Are you going to tell us what that one thing is? That was really important. I, I think this, <laughs> this reason is the lack of understanding of how to place people in the right place for the right tasks during the innovation. So this is an innovative idea in and of itself that we're not just thinking of people as you can just give somebody an assignment and they're going to go execute it, or that you just depend on your 270 PhDs, yep. but there's something more to that. But before we get there, I want to back up just a little bit. Because as we began to collaborate on this book, one of the conversations that we had that we've repeated several times since then yep. is that without the right innovation purpose, how do you know when you've succeeded? So let's talk a little bit about innovation purpose. So for you to have any success, any success, any level of success, innovation, it starts with the big reason why you're doing it, the strategy. And that strategy is what really drives the intrinsic and extrinsic thought process on how you're going to approach the innovation. That's the purpose. Why are we doing it and how are we doing it? And through that, you answer some really critical pro uh, questions that we, we ask in the book. And in, in your opinion, do most companies or organizations that decide they're going to innovate have a clear idea of the purpose behind a particular project? Uh, no. No, actually, that's where the failure begins. Because what happens is I may be trained on tools. And in our model of discovering purpose, you need five parts. But tools is only one part of it. And so you go directly to tools. Then you find out, oh, no, I needed to understand the other parts, which, which are part of where you need other people and to get creative and answer some of those questions so that you can have a clear purpose. Yeah, so you know what I'm thinking about? I'm thinking about all the tools I have in my garage Yeah. and how useless they are. Uh, I, I, Either because <laughs> I'm not committed to the purpose or yes. I don't know the appropriate way to use the tools. Is this part of where creativity plays into it? Is creativity a part of the process of getting to purpose? Absolutely. Because let's assume, for example... You are working on solving a specific problem, a marketing problem. 
it's one thing for you to say, I have this marketing problem. It's another thing for you to have clear understanding of the problem. That's where creativity comes in, to help you understand creative ways to understand, digest the problem, because if you don't understand the problem, you will never work on the right solution. So, so c- coming back to you, Courtney, because I know you've done this with a client recently where you helped them solve a marketing problem and mm-hmm. creativity and innovation was involved. How do you define creativity? How does that fit into the idea of solving a problem? You know, I, to me, creativity is really about just the momentum of moving through this idea with the purpose and with some kind of system behind it, but really just opening people up to trusting themselves a little bit to get to that sort of core center first and then leap ahead. I think we have this expectation that we can understand what the problem is and then we have to solve the problem, but we sort of fail to understand the human resources available to make that catalyze that in the most efficient way. And I think a lot of people by holding themselves back creatively paralyze themselves, a team or an organization just because they're not being bold enough with what they have to offer. I think a lot of times that comes from an organization or culture not making room for there to be safety to make mistakes. Yes. Because creativity is all about mistakes. And any good artist or creative person that has lived in that space a long time can tell you they're very comfortable with mistakes and criticism. And so I think that's a big part of it, just that level of self-awareness and being open to that. And it seems really clear to me, if I'm thinking about drawing or painting, that I'm going to get better through those mistakes. If I don't go through the mistakes, I never get very good. And artists are happy to. They practice, they wad it up, they throw it away. They practice, they wad it up, they throw it away. They're happy to get rid of it and move on. I think the average business person is not. They're Mm -hmm. very attached to the first part of the process. Mm -hmm. Well, when I think about creativity in business, another thing that really strikes me, and it comes back to what Evans was saying about people earlier is that a lot of creativity my impression is happens not just as individuals right but it's when we communicate and we work together and that really brings us to the innovation continuum yes so tell us what you mean by the innovation continuum actually before i move on to continuum i just want to to emphasize the need for creativity in the pro in the whole innovation Innovation is an idea game. Mm -hmm. It's a quantity quality. And you need a certain amount of ideas to really move the ball down the field. And I always give an example, and you have heard this many times, where every one of us have ideas. Then you start thinking about it, you scramble, the, uh, scramble and uh, get all the kind of different ideas, and then you have five. And then you go, uh, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> You're out of ideas. I know where we're going with this, <laughs> because I've read the research. <laughs> yeah, so, 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 and that's what happens to us. But that's what happens to a company. So the innovation continuum coming to that says the very first level of us creating momentum in innovation is to have a good ideation process and ideation stage. So this is the very first stage of six stages in the innovation. This is the way in an organization to generate and collect and consider ideas. Actually not consider, just correct. Ah, Just to collect them. We want as many ideas as possible of understanding the problem even long before we start talking about solution. Okay, great. So that's the first step in the continuum. And in the book, we write about these six different stages that we move through. Absolutely. And that each one of them has distinct goals, distinct outcomes, and distinct systems or tools for how to be successful at those six stages. Exactly. And then, of course, the most important part of that is not only are you looking for specific outcomes, but those out for you to get that out out those outcomes that was the big discovery for us yes we have to have certain personalities behaviors motivations skills talents of people at that specific and that's really what brought us together yes because your years of expertise around innovation 
Yes. And my passion for understanding people and talent, we began exactly. to recognize yep. that those, though these seem to be two different disciplines, they are married in an effective innovation process. Exactly. That's why those have to be connected. Yeah. So uh, going back to the creativity aspect, if you are going to be good at ideation, which is the very first stage, if you cannot go through the first stage, I don't think you'll go far in the rest of the stage. Without so, ideas, <laughs> nothing else happens. Yes, nothing right. else happens. Right. This is where uh, people and creativity comes in. So this is where Courtney can come into a room and help a team generate as many ideas as possible around whatever the context or the task you're trying to address. So she's unearthing what was there Yes. that we really hadn't given ourselves permission to develop. And you're not saying that the answers are there. You're saying that the, in the expression of creativity that we develop skills, we develop insights, we develop new capacities. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you and I work with in the book is that because there are these six different distinct stages of innovation, each one of them has an ideal kind of a pattern of a person's yes. behavioral style and yeah. what motivates them and what they're passionate about and what skills they've developed yeah. that's going to help to move us to the next stage. Absolutely. And one of our great ahas is that the things that make somebody excel in stage one can become the greatest impediments to getting through stage two. Exactly. So in stage two, for example, you define what the ideas are you generated them, and but now you start defining how they fit in the problem or the opportunity or the solution you're trying to solve. And I think you probably would relate to this, Evans, that in certain organizations, you see the potential of this greatness yeah. in these teams, yeah. and yet they won't let it bubble up because yeah. they're so afraid to fail. Yeah. And now that we're getting into an era of leadership in business where that's kind of becoming more okay, yeah. and our leaders are a little more awake and enlightened about that, and I think you bring a lot of that out in the work you do, Ron, that it really helps us have yeah. this opportunity to unblock that, and yeah. Then, yeah. then they can go down the path much yeah. more right. eloquently. And each of the stages has an element of creativity because every stage you may run into something and you need to be creative. This is a great idea. The ideas never stop. They, they never, just keep it, bubbling up and getting never, better and better and so better. So that's why creativity, for example, is a really important skill. You may not be the expert. You, your personality may, quote unquote, may not necessarily fit. But it doesn't mean you're not creative. Or you might have the great idea, yeah. even if you're not that person yes. in, in the mix. Yes. This is why you can't put Evans and I in a room very often. Yeah. We just never <laughs> hey, it's been a great conversation. <laughs> yeah. And if you'd like to find more out about the Innovators Advantage, you can go to theinnovatorsadvantage.com or you can pick up a copy of the book at amazon.com or your favorite bookstore.